Okay, this is chapter 11, Effective Team Management. It is one of the shorter chapters in the book, and it is the last chapter before the exam. Chapter 12 is there just for your own knowledge. Here are the learning objectives. Explain why groups and teams are key contributors to organizational effectiveness. Identify the different types of groups and teams that help managers and organizations achieve their goals. Explain how different elements of group dynamics influence the functioning and effectiveness of groups and teams. Explain why it is important for groups and teams to have a balance of conformity and deviance in a moderate level of cohesiveness. Describe how managers can motivate group members to achieve organizational goals and reduce social loafing in groups and teams. These are the definitions of group and team. They're quite similar. Group is two or more people who interact with each other to accomplish certain goals or meet certain needs. A team is a group, so it's already a group, whose members work intensely with each other to achieve a specific specific common goal or objective so a team is a group that meets more closely and with more intensity groups and teams can help an organization gain a competitive advantage because they can and I'm just gonna read through these enhance its performance increase its responsiveness to customers increase innovation increase employees' motivation and satisfaction. Groups can do better work than individuals can alone. Synergy, good definition to know, performance gains that result when individuals and departments coordinate their actions. So different departments are working together. For example, this would be research and development, working with finance on budgeting, marketing, working with operations on how to make products more satisfactory, etc. The takeaway here is that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Factors that contribute to synergy. Ability to bounce ideas off one another correct each other's errors, bring diverse knowledge base to bear on problems, accomplish projects beyond the scope of individuals. There's, these are some benefits to run through. And moving on to the next page, this is the same thing that we just read in red, and it leads to a competitive advantage, which is in green. Innovation is revolutionary. It is formally the creative development of new products, new technologies, new services, or even new organizational structures. To speed innovation, managers need to form teams in which each member brings some unique resource to the team. So something, so someone has to bring something to the team that no one else does for it to have the most value adding to the project. Groups and teams as motivators. Team members are more motivated and satisfied than if they were working alone. Working uh, in teams has some perks that working alone doesn't. Working alone can be pretty dull and boring and sad. Working with uh, team members, even if people may not necessarily get along with them, it does add to a person's interest level and it adds to a person's socialization. Team members can see the effect of their contribution to achieving team and organizational goals. Also, teams provide needed social interaction and help employees cope with work-related stressors, even if those stressors are other coworkers. It still provides social interaction. Types of groups and teams. I'm going to talk about the ones in blue. Cross-functional teams, cross-cultural teams, top management teams, research and development teams, command groups, task forces, self-managed work teams, virtual teams, friendship groups, and interest groups. Those are just some of the teams that we're going to be talking about all throughout the next several slides. Formal group is a group 
that managers establish to achieve organizational goals. So in this there is formal authority, meaning that the goals are already set and that there is a legitimate boss or decision maker. An informal group is a group that managers or non-managerial employees form to help achieve their own goals or to meet their own needs. It's less formal, so there's no main leader sometimes. Sometimes it could be over lunch or in informal situations. And they determine their own goals, and those goals are determined on an ongoing basis. Top management team, and this is a group of the CEO, president, and the heads of the most important departments, which would be the C-level employees or the VPs of different departments. Research and development team. This is a team whose members have the expertise and experience needed to develop new products. So depending on the organization, this could be quite a large group. Next is the command group, and this is a group composed of subordinates who report to the same supervisor, also called the department or unit. So if you remember what some of the department names are, they would be marketing, finance, operations, accounting, etc., etc. So same idea here for command group. Task force. This is a committee of managers or non-managerial employees from various departments or divisions who meet to solve a specific mutual problem, also called an ad hoc committee. So this could be for special projects such as safety projects, it could be for building projects, it could be for grants, etc. But it's for unusual or not very common circumstances. Once in a while projects we could say. Then there's a self-managed work team, and this is a group of employees who supervise their own activities and monitor the quality of the goods and services they provide. So the authority here is unspecified. There is no real boss within the group, and there is shared responsibility throughout the group. Virtual team. This is a team whose members rarely or never meet face to face but interact by using various forms of information technology like email, computer networks, telephone, fax, and video conferences. So we actually talked about this um, in one of our previous lectures and basically the teams would meet through different software such as Skype, GoToMeeting, Zoom, or just through the phone or email. Friendship group is an informal group composed of employees who enjoy one another's company and socialize with each other. So on my sheet I have written down Captain Planet, which is a friendship group that saves the world, but at the same time this would be simply friends at a workplace. Interest group is an informal group of employees seeking to achieve a common goal related to their membership in an organization. This could be different adjunct professors at a community college. Okay. Group size. Members of small groups tend to interact more with each other and find it easier to coordinate their efforts. Be more motivated, satisfied, and committed. Find it easier to share information. Be better able to see the importance of their personal contributions for group success. So, something for you to think about why some of those points might be. Most of my classes at the collegiate level have been pretty small. So, something that I've noticed is that a lot of uh, students stay in good touch with each other. Division of labor. Splitting the work to be performed into particular tasks and assigning tasks to individual workers. So this is a key part of management right here and we'll talk more about this in the following slides when we talk about group roles. A group role is a set of behaviors and tasks that a group member is expected to perform because of his position in the group. Role making is taking the initiative to modify an assigned role by assuming additional responsibilities. 
So a group role you could think of as role playing, role making you could think of as empowerment, especially if employees decide their own roles. Now we're on the stages of group development. There are, there are a total of five stages. The first one is forming. Group members get to know each other and reach common understanding. Stage two, storming. Group members experience conflict and disagreements because some of the members do not wish to submit to the demands of the other group members. Okay, so and this could be something very petty or it could be something larger. Most of the time it's something very petty. And uh, some of the things that group members would be doing would be brainstorming and uh, having some reluctance in the group in the storming stage. And it's actually storming right now while uh, I'm recording this. Norming. Stage three, close ties and consensus begin to develop between group members. Okay, so people are spending more time together, so they're, they're becoming tighter with each other. Four, stage four, performing. The real work of the group gets accomplished. During this, the implementation gets done. Stage five, the last stage, adjourning. The group is dispersed, and this takes place when a group completes a finished product or project. This slide is just showing the five stages, forming, storming, norming, performing, and journeying. Group, sorry, group norms. Shared guidelines or rules for behavior that most group members follow. Okay, so just like cultural norms and social norms, most people would be following this. Conformity and deviance. Members conform to norms to obtain rewards, imitate respected members, and because they feel the behavior is right. Conformity and deviance must be balanced for high performance from the group. So it's also something for you to think about why do people deviate. Balancing conformity and deviance in groups. At the left hand side, the low level of group performance you could see that there's low conformity and high deviance that means that everyone's basically just goofing around and then high conformity low deviance that is usually a signal of success um, but too much conformity and a lack of deviance results in low performance because they fail to change the dysfunctional norms and then right in the middle is moderate conformity and moderate deviance so everyone's doing whatever makes the most sense for themselves and for the group overall. So this would mean the highest performance. Group cohesiveness. The degree to which members are attracted to or loyal to their group. The three major consequences or results of group cohesiveness are the level of participation, level of conformity to group norms, and the emphasis on group goal accomplishment. Sources and consequences of group cohesiveness. Okay, so factors leading to group cohesiveness on the left, group size effectively managed diversity, group identity and healthy competition and success. Group cohesiveness in the middle then leads to consequences of group cohesiveness on the right, level of participation within a group, level of conformity to group norms, emphasis on group goal accomplishment. So this I'm going to read through, it's the factors leading to group cohesiveness. The group size. Smaller groups allow for high cohesiveness, low cohesiveness groups with many members can benefit from splitting into two groups. Effectively managed diversity, diverse groups often come up with more innovative and creative ideas. Group identity and healthy competition, encouraging a group to adopt a unique identity and engage in competition with others can increase cohesiveness and success. Cohesiveness increases with success, finding ways for a group to have some small successes increases cohesiveness. Motivating group members to achieve organizational goals. Members should benefit when the group performs well. Rewards can be monetary or in other forms such as special recognition. Individual compensation is a combination of both individual and group performance. Social loafing. 
I'm thinking about a bread a loaf of bread right now because I'm hungry. Uh, social loafing is a tendency of individuals to put forth less effort when they work in groups than when they work alone. Why is this? If they put in less effort individually, they think that the other group members are going to make up for their lack of effort. So that's why it's called loafing, to be kind of lazy. This is like an old-fashioned term. Three ways to reduce social loafing. Making the individual contributions to a group project identifiable when possible. Emphasizing the valuable contributions of individual members. And keeping group size at an appropriate level. These three things should reduce social loafing overall. And that is chapter 11, Effective Teams. If you have any questions about this, please feel free to ask me in class or send me an email.